Okay, everybody, settle down and gather around your internet listening device. It is time for the Nostalgia Trap. My name is David Parsons. Thanks so much for tuning into the program. Got a great guest for you today, Ken Lane of Desert Oracle. If you don't know what Desert Oracle is, you're missing out on one of the coolest uh, and most compelling cultural productions of our era. I really mean that. I first found Desert Oracle when I was actually in the Mojave Desert. Uh, I was at a place called Cactus Mart, saw the little chapbook magazine called Desert or- Oracle that caught my my eye because it looked like the underground radical publications from the 1960s and 70s that I love so much and think are so important. Uh, and it, may, it, it led me to discover Ken Lane, who is someone who you'll find out in this interview uh, is, is, is someone who's been in media for a while. Uh, we talk a lot about his history with Gawker. And Gawker is something that, you know, is so important. I think people will be looking back at Gawker and the whole arc, the whole evolution, because it's a kind of tragic evolution. Ultimately, we talk about that, how Gawker moved from this thing that was created in a, a, a by people who were very much interested in overturning the kind of elite Ivy League stranglehold on whatever we think of as a liberal mainstream media and create something that answered a different sensibility and a different set of values. And Gawker is incredibly culturally important. And I think, you know, its evolution is is historically important as well in the sense that it shows us this this arc this kind of cycle that Ken and I talk about of how underground culture moves from the underground through the layers of capitalism and how its messages and ideas and values get washed out uh, and what we can do about that sort of inevitable process. So it's a really important moment right now to be talking about this stuff because we're at another uh, media moment. That Gawker story continues. There is still Uh, I think this elite, mainstream, Ivy League, liberal media that does have a stranglehold on the discourse in America. Um, But at the same time, there's this also just rush of independent media that's from all, uh, you know, all points of the political and cultural spectrum. Um, And it's it's unclear where all of that is headed. And we're seeing some that are more successful than others. Certainly like Joe Rogan, who we talk about in this conversation, just signed with Spotify for like, you know, hundreds of fucking billion dollars. All of that is is it means that we're in, um, you know, a, a, a kind of transitional moment when it comes to media. And Ken has a lot to say about that, both with his work with Desert Oracle right now, but also his his wider history working in kind of traditional media. He comes from newspapers uh, and ultimately through the the Gawker Media Network and out the other side of it. So this is a really fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you can find more Nostalgia Trap stuff all over the place, but uh, go to NostalgiaTrap.com to see all our free episodes. And if you want access to our bonus episodes where we're talking about all sorts of things. We have a great one with uh, Yasmin Nair about Tom Cruise that we put up last week. People seem to be enjoying it. Uh, so patreon.com slash nostalgia trap is where you can get access to our bonus stuff. And let me also mention that this Friday, May 29th, I will be giving a lecture online uh, through the Think Olio group. So go to thinkolio.org. I'll be lecturing about the legacy of the 1960s as uh, expressed in the film The Big Lebowski. So if you want to hear me talk about The Big Lebowski and how it connects to some of the most important uh, political and cultural and social trends to emerge from the 60s and 70s, uh, go to thinkolio.org. And again, that's this Friday. I'm really excited to be doing that. Uh, So hope to see some of you there. All right. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Here is me uh, with Ken Lane of Desert Oracle. Okay, Ken Lane, it is such a delight to finally speak with you. I was, uh, I, I discovered you, uh, maybe this is part of the way you intended to be discovered, but I was at a place called Cactus Mart uh, in Morongo Valley a couple years ago and saw a copy of Desert Oracle, uh, which, you know, I, I there are a lot of ways that, that I can think about what you do, but part of it seems like you're almost like a booster for that area. Um, it felt like I had discovered a voice in a scene that I didn't know existed. Um, but I thank you for joining me. Um, and I just wanted to say you have like a really specific set of, uh, or a, a very specific sense of place in what you do. And I'm wondering kind of like, I don't know, what is the Mojave Desert looking like uh, these days? Because it seems like every 
every place is experiencing the pandemic in a more I, I, like I don't know, regional way. We've been talking about that on the show, and I'm wondering what it looks like where from where you're perched. Well, thanks for having me on your podcast, and it's true that while maybe not quite a, a booster, <laughs> because uh, I don't necessarily agree with what's being boosted by different factions of society and commerce out here, <laughs> but the idea of of Desert Oracle is very much about feeling like you live somewhere, like you're not just another biological robot in a condo in some place that could be anywhere, you mm. know, it could be Florida or the Sun Belt or the Southwest or, and, and you know, the last 10 years or so, that sort of architectural style, the stucco lookalike sort of stuff is is everywhere you know i'm in like upstate new york and you see stuff that looks like like it's from orange county california and so the whole idea was we only have this one short life and robbing <laughs> ourselves of of feeling like we're in a real place that we're part of a a living place is is just a, a terrible price to pay for being kind of forced to be in the the current system. So out here, like a lot of tourist places, we got hit hard because a lot of the economy is based on visiting the wild Mojave, Joshua Tree National Park, the mm -hmm. National Monuments out beyond, and they all got closed down. All the vacation rentals and hotels were shut down. We hardly have any restaurants to shut down, but they got those too, and our few bars. And so life kind of came to a halt, and all the stuff that makes it fun and interesting and charming and weird to live in a place like this, well, some of those are still there, but you're kind of reduced to strip malls with grocery stores and drive throughs like everywhere else. So. It's been, uh, it's nice not to be crushed by tourists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it'd be nice to have a balance somewhere between zero and three million a year, which is what we have when things are regular right now. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I mean, I'm kind of one of those tourists, I think. I mean, I grew up going to, um, you know, the big places. My, my parents took us out to Las Vegas and Palm Springs. I'm from Ventura, California, by the way, and that's where I am now. And I lived, I lived in Brooklyn for 15 years, though. So I feel like I've got like, I don't know, like you, I, I, reading your biography, you've lived in a, a bunch of different places and you get to you end up feeling like, um, I don't know, that divide between the city and the country isn't as as wide as people think it's like there's a there's there's a pretty diverse set of places to exist in america but at the same time you know i've had that feeling of like standing i remember standing outside smoking a cigarette at a bj's brew house uh looking at the circuit city in the parking lot and looking at the palm tree and the cement and thinking i could be anywhere in america right now like i could literally be <laughs> anywhere yeah and that that part of it God, I hadn't thought of it that way. That's such a tragedy because what makes uh what makes us go up to you know the Yucca Valley and all that stuff beyond the 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 Joshua Tree is all the like quirky businesses and they're all shut. I hadn't really thought of it that way. That like it would almost make the only the only shit that's open is the Circuit City type type stuff. I know Circuit City's out of business. That's an old reference, but either way, um, well, we have the yeah. Verizon store is open. Of course, they're a. Uh, uh, a crucial business in our current era, What's but all the like the bookstores and the record stores and the thrift shops and the weird old diners where you can hang out for half the day, they're all closed or in the case of the diner take out only. And you know, thank God you can get outside and walk here. They close the national park. They can't close the rest of the Mojave. Mm, you know, the, yeah. A lot of people come out here and they think Joshua Tree National Park is it, and it's not. It's a little sliver of the Mojave. And yeah, yeah. You know, that's a, it feels like that's the most popular place. 
it's it's most popular because it's in the zone. Yeah, it's in the L.A. kind of two hour. You can get in and out kind of thing. And you're in Ventura, so you know what happened to real estate and vacation rentals anywhere coastal. The coast used to be where Southern California played. You know, that's where they had weekends and mm-hmm. vacations and that kind of thing. That got priced out for just about everybody except multimillionaires. And people started looking for other interesting places to go. So the desert used to have a real kind of quirky, oddball sort of tourist base. And then it became the place to go. So Coachella helped because we have a lot of side events to Coachella up here. It's a half hour from the low desert, 45 minutes from the the polo grounds where they have that thing. The hipsters discovered the the desert in recent years. I I feel like I'm I'm part of that crowd. I mean, I never went to Coachella and I don't want to go to a music festival. Um, But at the same time, uh, it was, I think, honestly, I heard about the Yucca Valley and that area up there, Um, you know, beyond just my dad talking about being a Marine in the 60s and training at 29 Palms. There was nothing up there to me in my imagination until someone mentioned like Pioneer Town and Pappy and Harriet's and like Paul McCartney playing up there and all this like kind of like, I don't know, this kind of music scene and counterculture up there. Is that something I guess part of me wants to know, because when I saw Desert Oracle, Desert Oracle in Cactus Mart, I was thinking to myself, oh, there, there is like kind of a coherent culture here. There is something going on. Um, and, and I wanted to know kind of, can you tell me how long has that been going on? Is that something that's, uh, you know, been a kind of long gestating culture? Is it a new flash or what's the history of that? So there's a couple of parts to it. And my part with Desert Oracle was to try to make something cohesive out of the kind of random elements that were out here mm. because I did see things that were linked that weren't really even linked in the kind of community mind, but they were, they were starting to get that way. So the musician thing goes back a long time. The, a lot of the first people who lived in the village of Joshua tree near the West entrance were artists and musicians and writers, people who had been in Los Angeles for work, usually for creative work. And but they weren't like big deals. They didn't have a lot of money and they like quiet and they appreciated the beauty of the desert, which is not a thing that was common in America in the last century. Mm. So famously or infamously, you had Graham Parsons from the birds and the flying burrito brothers. I know I know him well. Yeah, he he was he loved it out here and he came out here to sort of get away from things whenever he could starting in the late 60s. He brought Keith Richards That's and right. Anita Pallenberg out here. There's some pictures that float around on the internet of you know, Keith Richards shirtless standing on a boulder with like a Mexican blanket on his shoulders on a cold morning, you know, so it was it was a place where you'd see these weird people, and they tended to stay at the Joshua Tree Inn, which was about the only lodging in the late 60s, early 70s out here. And over the years, people came out here and started building recording studios. So we have Rancho de la Luna, a kind of alternative, independent rock and roll recording studio that's tied up with the desert rock scene of the early 2000s. And Iggy Pop did his, was it his last record? I think it was his last record out Mm -hmm. here. DJ Harvey is recorded here. You get a lot of uh, interesting kind of musical characters. This was before the Coachella thing made it more of a thing to see, a spectator sport. But then you got Pappy's, which is old movie cantina. All of Pioneer Town was built by Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and all these characters so that they could do their TV shows in the 50s without driving a long way to work. So they built these houses 
and they'd ride their horses down to the fake town for work. Right. <laughs> so Pioneer Town started off that way, and then by the early mid sixties, the T V Western thing was pretty much gone except for Bonanza, which persisted for a little bit. And so it sort of went to seed as all these kind of good guy cowboys sort of faded out. And then it came back as a place where you'd shoot music videos and they had a biker bar. That's what Pappy's is. You know, right. They had like yeah. Fritos and whiskey and pool tables. And and now you have to make rather reservations. It's very fancy now. That's right. I mean, we've gone up there a couple of times. I'm I'm part of that 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 crowd in some ways. I mean, I don't feel like it, but at the same time, I guess something drew us up there. I'm I'm wondering um at what point in in your life do you, I mean, do you, does it feel like I mean, part of me always thinks, "Oh, I'll end up in the desert. I'll end up there." But it's always like the end up you know, the, in other words, people like the, the, it's always like I'll end up in the desert. In other words, the last stand. Right. I mean, I, I like I said, I lived in Brooklyn for 15 years. I thought I was going to live in New York all my life. But um, as as it happened, I had the opportunity to come back here to where my hometown was. And I and, and, and we're just living here now. And it feels like I retired a little bit, like after living in Brooklyn for all those years and being in like that insane crowd. um being in a small coastal town in California feels like retirement. Um, so I'm wondering like what, what drew you when, at what point in your life did you, did you decide to go to the desert? Cause you, you, you haven't lived there your whole life, right? It's something that was kind of like your backyard. No, I did not live here. The first desert I lived in was a desert that my dad grew up, which was the Sonoran in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And he did not love it. He was anxious to get out of there, but, as it turned out, his brother lived there, and we ended up moving there for a while when I was in, oh, what was it, middle school, I guess? Mm. Is that what they call it now? Yeah. Junior high. So that was the first time I lived in the desert, and I just took to it. I thought it was incredible. I grew up in New Orleans where you couldn't see more than about 10 feet away <laughs> because you're below sea level. There's no hills. There's no mountains. And it rains all the time, and people don't like to go outside for, you know, half the year because it's too hot and humid, and the mosquitoes will eat you. So I just loved it. I went to a school camp up at Lake Pleasant, north of Phoenix, and it was like a desert botany and biology science camp. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd ever been around people who dug it, you know, who, who <laughs> liked the animals and things like that that and i thought it was fantastic and i'd come back and try to talk about it and my dad would be like yeah they ought to pave this whole place over you know? <laughs> of course he was up working on air conditioning on rooftops so he mostly thought of the desert as something to survive the work day you know mm. to get through the work day in this terrible environment so eventually i lived in coastal california as well because that's every person who's ever lived in Phoenix. That's their dream. Oh, God, I want to move to San Diego. <laughs> yeah, it San really, Diego. You know, it, I've spent zero time in San Diego in my life. But everyone who I've mentioned over the years, like wherever I've been in America, and and mentioned that I live in you know California or I come from a coastal town, they always want to hear about San Diego. It seems like it's a a ripe spot in the cultural imagination. I guess. I mean, I you know I live there through some. Uh, formative years you know high school years early adulthood and it felt like the most oppressive um hmm. it was it was sort of like orange county without the commitment <laughs> orange county i think that's was, the official slogan of san diego <laughs> i think so yeah, yeah was, and and there was this sort of knee-jerk hatred and disgust with even the idea of Los Angeles, which is where all the culture was going on when I was a kid, the punk rock and the underground movies and everything else. And you were just surrounded by these people like in board shorts and flip flops <laughs> who, who were, were repulsed at even the idea that there was this dirty city, just like an hour up the road, you know, full of, uh, crazy nightclub scenes and art scenes and everything. So it was, uh, I started going out to the desert as soon as I got a driver's permit, mm. which was in the early eighties. And 
I just loved it. I love Death Valley. I love Joshua Tree. I love just the open Mojave, uh, the wilderness areas up in Eastern California. And there wasn't pre-internet. I was a writer and a musician and stuff, so there wasn't a whole lot you could do for work. So I guess I kind of had that same thing in mind. One day, I would like to live full-time in the desert. I can't right now. Mm. And so the time I ended up moving to the desert full-time was when, just in the last 15, 16 years or so, when the internet got reliable enough that you could work away from a major metropolitan area. Yeah, that's a that's a, a part of your biography that I found fascinating. I mean, you're like a Forrest Gump character, dude. Like, you're, you're it feels like your <laughs> life has been. And I mean that in the best way. I don't. I mean that in the way that you know you've been involved in a lot of different. Um, I don't know, like historical trends. And one of them, like I've been trying to get my mind around, is just like what happened in media when the internet started, um, and and how that's transformed into today. Like we're we're talking right now when like I don't know Vice just like fired everybody or something I, I saw it in the news recently uh that 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 part and that when i think about vice even just that that's been a trajectory in my life you know from like being a very young person and seeing media that was different um and i was that kind of the consumer end of it but you were at par, par, like involved in all of that right like you were part of um a media network that in part like I don't know. Like Gawker drew me to New York. I'll say that. Like in 2003, 2004, it was partly, it was a part of like understanding that there was a scene. So it's like, I don't know. What I'm trying to say is in the same way that Desert Oracle made me aware that something was going on, like a certain culture, um, Gawker played play that role too. So I'm wondering like, kind of like, w were you a writer before the internet began and were you working in print and then the internet began and you started a website or how did that, how did that trajectory happen for you? Yeah, well, the how long's your podcast? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, let's let's do the short version. Yep, the short yeah. version is uh, I did journalism in high school. I went to one of these magnet high schools in Southern California to try to draw the. The, the the white kids to to the barrio mm, yep and which i love the whole idea of so i went to the high school and maybe the only kind of culturally interesting part of san diego which was downtown mm. by the harbor and by barrio logan and where all the drunken sailors would be out with the winos and the you know hookers and everything it had it was this like navy town downtown mm -hmm. yeah so they had television production, audio production, and then the usual like school newspapers and photography and stuff. So I just did all that stuff. I loved it. And I did, we had like a cable news show on Friday nights on Cox Cable. It was the, I think it was the biggest, geographically, it was the biggest school district in the country. So uh, we did a newscast. We did, Whatever I'd see, I you know I could I'd go in and say I want to do this. You know they'd say oh you need to interview the school superintendent or something, and I'd say you know I like how Tom Snyder does that on the Tomorrow Show. <laughs> it's super dark and it's two chairs and and they'd say sure whatever I didn't care. <laughs> so I got to play with all that stuff, and then I kind of burnt out on it by the time I was out of out of high school, and decided well what i really want to do is music so for i don't know a half dozen years i did music we put out records on indie labels and toured the region and college radio and all that which i loved but by the end of it i was kind of worn out on the music that was being played and music was changing and I was not, uh, I was not in a setup to keep going that way. And I thought, well, this is a great time to get out of this <laughs> and do something else that sounds fun, which is I want to work at a daily paper. So I ended up working at a daily paper on Oceanside for a number of years. Oceanside's a lot like Ventura. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I, I, I think kind I mean of like, you know, it's like a middle place. It's not 
the famous beach place. It's kind of the seedy beach place. You know, it ain't Santa Barbara. No, no. It's kind of the redneck Santa Barbara. It's like a miniature. I mean, I think of uh, on the one hand, Ventura and Oceanside, you know, they're they're like kind of miniature San Diego's in some ways. Like there's like a Orange County Republican thing going on. But we've also got something in Ventura, like an element we call Ventucky. That's kind of like the, um, I don't know, the old Oki population. Uh, We've also got, obviously, like it's a huge agricultural center. So there's tons of uh, uh, Latino people like everywhere and and not just in the like agricultural work, but in the middle class, too. So it's a mix. It's like it's very easy to like kind of stereotype the town. But Ventura is and, and I guess Oceanside, too, is like a little more complicated than than the than the bigger places. They, yeah, they are, and the the presence of the the military of uh, the Navy That's base right. where you yep. are, and the Marine base where Oceanside is, and where I am now. Dude, I teach at the uh, Navy base, or at least before um, the the plague came, I was teaching at the Navy really? base. Really? Yeah, out the at Point Magoo. And, you know, that's I mean, that's my whole family history out here is in the military end of it. Um, I'm not in the military myself and never have been, but I've been kind of adjacent, I guess. And, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very particular culture. And like around the Navy base is all just like, I don't know, like, um, you know, bail bonds, tattoo shops, you know, kind of seedy businesses and strip malls and stuff like that. It definitely has a very particular flavor to it. Yeah, yeah, it's got a real like honky tonk kind of old yep. America, <laughs> you know, buzz cuts and used car lots and everything. Super weird. I, yeah, I I loved it in Oceanside. I mean, I both loved it and and loathed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and. But it's, because it's it scary, just, it dude. Those just... places are scary. And like when I lived, I lived out there for a brief time, my early 20s out in like the Navy town you're talking about. And like I, I went to a dive bar thinking I'm going to go get some beers at the dive bar and be one of these cool locals. And I got robbed there the first time I went there. <laughs> <laughs> so and it was like that was literally like the end of my like I'm a g- c- kind of guy that can go into any bar, you know, and like order a Jack Daniels. Like as soon as I got in there, like I sat down and like a bunch of dudes came up to me and took my money <laughs> oh good lord I, I i guess i was lucky that i mean i've been playing in bars since i was 16 years old as a mm-hmm. you know, musician so you you know i never i never had any scuffles really but you learn to be you learn to kind of walk walk through those things it's like you're in a wind tunnel with <laughs> a lot of you know broken glass and knives flying through the air and you just kind of got to maneuver through it because you got to come back tomorrow, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. It, they'll be uh, sleeping it off or waiting until next payday. Uh, yeah. So it was. Uh, it was a fun newspaper town. I've written a little bit about being there, but it was. It was just one of those great. It started off as a PM paper when I started working there in the afternoon. And those were going quickly by that time, and you just if you showed any aptitude at all they let you do whatever you wanted. So I got to cover the base for a while, like during the first Gulf War. Uh, I was a police reporter, police and courts. I did city hall. I did like agriculture and environment. Just kind of moved, you know, whatever was interesting. And it, a small enough paper that maybe were, I don't know, 60 or 70 editorial people there. You could kind of muscle in and do whatever you wanted. So if I read a book I liked, I wanted to write a book review, I could do it. If I wanted to go somewhere and claim it was for work, I'd write a travel story. So it was a great education and just environment. And so I was on, I was also on the news desk as a copy editor and a. That's awesome. Fire You're like living editor. a life from a movie that's like only in movies now. Like the 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 hey, the, 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 the plucky reporter. There's so much romance and nostalgia invested in that image. In part, maybe yeah. maybe it's because it's disappeared in our lifetime. But I think yeah. that's part of it. That's part of it. I mean, you really are just like the king of town with that kind of thing. Just kind of cruising around in your beat up truck with your one necktie and <laughs> seeing people and arguing with people everywhere you go, but you know, feeling like you're you're actually part of this place and all the little scandals and the crime and the corruption and the local mafia and the Marines getting caught doing porno shoots. You know, they, they're always trying to make a few bucks. They're not gay. They just need a little money so they can buy that Dodge Charger. 
Yeah, that's like a fucking noir plot right there. Oh, it was so, yeah. I mean, just the other day on Twitter, because I've had this novel kind of thing I've been working on for, I don't know, 15 years about that particular place, starting off from something I, I wrote for The All about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And somebody was on Twitter saying, why isn't there a you know prestige TV series about a small town newspaper thing? And I was looking at that and thinking, well, maybe that's what it should be. It's so visual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Oceanside never really got too gussied up other than about like 30 feet off the actual beach. <laughs> like there you'd have these monstrosities, these mansions that you see wherever there's sand and water on the other side. But just beyond that, literally, there's railroad tracks and then it's like a working class kind of hard scrabble place. So that's we'll how, I mean, that's how Waikiki Beach is in Hawaii. Like I was kind of I, I only went there like one time when I was a kid. And like it's kind of like stunning that like the whole front of the beach is just these like, you know, resorts. And then right behind that is just like total poverty. Like, they, oh, yeah. They don't, I mean, yeah, they, they you, even try to hide it. The sea breeze, you know, and it's it's rough going. Mm. So I ended up moving out to Eastern Europe for a number of years because all these revolutions were going on and it's exciting you know it's like this is like the late late 80s was, early 90s yeah yeah that, yeah you know Prague went uh, the berlin wall the berlin wall happened when i was working the desk one day and these these images you know these old wire machines they'd come out and they'd print out three pictures in the the three primary colors and then they'd mix them in production out back So these pictures were coming out of these people dancing on top of the Berlin Wall, like chopping at it and everything. And I remember these pictures coming out and thinking it looks just like that that video that The Clash made for Radio (laughs) Clash. (laughs) And uh, this is real. This is happening. I got to, you know, get the hell out of here and um, go see what's going on. So you wanted you I, wanted a front seat. You didn't want to avoid the apocalypse. You wanted to be right yeah, well, right I in wanted, it. Yeah, I wanted to see what was going on. And then you had like Václav Havel becoming president of of what was then Czechoslovakia. This countercultural avant garde playwright and velvet underground fanatic. And uh, it, it just it just sounded so. I so feel like there was a whole. You're connecting something for me here, which I feel like there's a whole generation of writers who are just a slightly older than me, but media people that like were that were in Eastern Europe for that, and that were like that were interested in that part of it, and like that, and and that spun off after after that into what I'm I guess what I'm trying to loosely describe as like snark journalism, but like what I'm more I mean I'm more interested in kind of like I don't know it feels like an insurgency of a different kind of writer. And a different kind of like engagement with journalism that eventually ended up kind of playing out in the mainstream in really weird, it's, w- weird it's ways. Very true. But. And I'll tell you some of the uh, one of the, one of the people I met. This is when I was a couple of years later living in Budapest. I met this guy from England who was I, nobody really liked him. He was kind of like off-putting, but you could tell he was really smart Mm. and he had interesting ideas. He was just kind of socially inept. You're describing every graduate student I've known, but... (laughs) This one, he... Yeah, he had come out of... uh, I don't remember which which school, but you know he was like an Oxford person and then he worked at the Financial Times and he wrote like uh, co-wrote a book about a financial scandal and then he ends up because he's half Hungarian he ends up in in Budapest because he can speak the language mm. so I run into this guy and then I leave and go to San Francisco because I know some people there and I figure it's a cheap place to live it was very cheap to live there then it was kind of it was depressed and this is like even before the first like dot com thing yeah this was the the first but as that was starting i mean that's always a part of the bay area but it's like san francisco existed sort of somewhat separately from that it had its own underground sort of hacker culture with mondo 2000 and sf net and 
Wired was starting at the yeah, time. Yeah, I remember all this. Yep. So it was it was kind of fun. It was a fun scene there. And I ended up starting one of the first independent news sites that wasn't attached to a, you know, a newspaper or whatever called tabloid.net mm-hmm. with a buddy of mine from Eastern Europe who I knew from there who moved to San Francisco as well. So we're doing that. And the guy from Budapest is Nick Denton. <laughs> so he shows up. He got the Financial Times to send him out there to write about the emerging Silicon Valley scene. So we got together and he started a headline aggregation thing and he was he wanted to buy my site, tabloid.net, but he only wanted to pay us fifty thousand dollars for it. And we thought, ah, oh, so you know, we don't want to do that. Of course, no one else ever offered any real money. <laughs> so we should have. Um and but he just wanted us to work and do that kind of uh the the kind of more personality driven, less safe, less kind of corporate media voice that had really taken over by the nineties, uh, in in news and in in cultural reporting as well. It was very dull. Yeah, I, I mean, it's funny because I was reading about your. Um, I know this is jumping ahead a bit, but the L.A. Examiner and like your experience with that, and you know, trying to. I think that's part of, you know, on this show, we talk so much about politics. We're always trying to, like, put things into categories like left and right. But with this kind of media thing that happened, it seems like it's more, I don't know, vaguely anti-authoritarian or anti, maybe anti-establishment is the right way of putting it. But Very much. Yeah, because because it, it feels like those figures from Nick Denton to, you know, the, the, the people that created Vice, I mean, they all spun off into, like, all sorts of weird political circles. Like, some of them are, like, right libertarian. Some of them are, like, um, you know, like, Marxist and shit like that. Like, you have, like, in other words, it seems it's more... Um, in that er- in those early years, it's it's it it the the thing that's defining it is it's 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 unified like revulsion with establishment media, whatever it had, be, had that, become. That yeah. really was it. I mean, with as I'd come out of these, the sort of last of the old PM dailies, which were very tabloidy because most of their buyers were afternoon buyers. You'd get them when you got off the train, got off the the Amtrak to go home, you know, or you'd mm-hmm. get them when you went to the liquor store because they had the sports final. And these things, they were just punchier. The, you engage with the reader. You didn't stand over the reader and and do this kind of like uh, faux objectivity of the New York Times, which is never accurate. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's always like, Oh no, we're up, we're above such things as like saying there's a difference between wrong and right and that sort of stuff, which infuriated me. It's the worst, the, especially when their yeah. agenda is so like on the surface, and then that the kind of like this weird notion of pretending objectivity. I mean that I mean that that kind of shit led to the whole fair and balanced shit that Fox News it gets did. away with, right? That it the, very much this, did, yeah. Uh, ugh. God, yeah, the worst. I mean, uh, reading the LA Examiner interview, interview or the interview with you about the LA Examiner, I should say. Um, I was thinking about that, in, and I wonder what you could say about the LA Times because the LA Times seems like it was the object of your, uh, in some ways, like it was the foil to what you were trying to do. And and the LA Times is a paper that, you know, I I know the wider, longer history of it, like as this like corrupt, uh, you know, I know the like Chinatown LA Times, you know, and like the Chandler era. But what was the LA Times in the '90s? Like, what had it? What had it become? So with the LA, and I have a lot of friends at the LA Times. Uh, <laughs> I've written for the LA Times a lot, you know. So, and I think it is a better paper than most people give it credit for and it definitely looms large in southern california and on the west coast at the in the 1980s they got pretensions of they were going to be like the next washington post new york times like they got an editor from the washington post i got editors from the new york times and that was the thing that always kind of drove me nuts. It's like, why are you all always looking to the East Coast? Mm, yeah. Instead of looking at the people who are here, who know what's going on here. And that goes from cultural figures to reporters and editors you could hire. 
but they wanted the approval because by this time journalism has become a, a an elite business all the way around. So I was one of the last that could kind of come out of high school and get on the copy desk and proving you could handle things and not screw it up. And they let you do whatever you want. Mm. So when you say elite, you mean like all of a sudden it's like Ivy League people and like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not, you know, college degrees weren't even asked about at most newspapers going into the 80s. Yeah, it's funny because when you think when I think about that and I know it's a it's a popular image, but like when I think about that plucky reporter we had mentioned in like noir films and, you know, even into the 70s, you know, I didn't think of those guys as like I didn't think of that figure as a elite intellectual figure. It would always seem like almost like a working class kind of dude. And that was that was what part of what made that reporter uh, that was like one of that that reporter's like greatest strengths was his, his ability to kind of talk to a population of ordinary people. Right. And this was something that became an archetype with Jimmy Breslin. <laughs> yes. And with Mike Royko. This sort of I'll be down at the bar if you need to talk to me. <laughs> kind of thing. And they played it up more. But it re- that really was kind of the how you covered politics or the school board or the labor union. You did it by being around as a person and being comfortable with people around you. And for instance, like uh, uh, Royko in Chicago was friends with John Belushi. Mm -hmm. He wasn't friends with John Belushi because John Belushi was a celebrity. He was friends with John Belushi because John Belushi's Albanian American family were neighborhood people in Royko's neighborhood. Mm. So they had they went to the same bars right. like the Billy Goat in Chicago and that kind of thing. So, yeah, so it's I wound up in Los Angeles after the dot com collapse or shortly before when it became apparent nobody was going to write us a check to continue operations because we were too obnoxious. We got a lot of press. We had a lot of readers. But. It wasn't it wasn't a good investment for mm. uh, Sand Hill Road. Mm. So I end up in L.A. with my old friend Matt Welch. Speaking of people who went in uh, anti-establishment political ways, I met him in Prague. He's from Long Beach. He was kind of like the usual sort of college liberal, I guess, at the time. Mm-hmm. He ended up becoming a, 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 a libertarian or what he thinks of as being libertarian and being editor of Reason Magazine and all this stuff. So he's the guy I did LA Examiner with. LA Examiner, the idea was we're going to do a blog. Both of us are very into blogging in the like 911 era. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. Personally. Yeah. You know, we, we wrote blogs. Yeah. That's what we did. And our friend Henry Copeland, who was one of our editors in, in Hungary and uh, Eastern Europe in general, he started a, a blog ads company so that a lot of us could make a living from blogging after that. It was called Blog Ads. Um, and we just wanted to be the thorn in the side of these Ivy Leaguers who'd come out and gotten editing and column writing and criticism jobs at the LA times and who seem to have not only very little knowledge of Los Angeles and SoCal, which is fine. You know, you can always learn, but they had no curiosity. Mm. So they were writing from a viewpoint of people who look down at being in Los Angeles. And we just thought that was stupid. We thought what well, LA's the cultural capital of earth, you know, for good or ill. Yeah. And how do you just kind of act like it's all distasteful? So we started off that way. Nick Denton liked the idea. He starts Gawker, which is in a much better place to do that because he'd moved to New York. Mm-hmm. And he hired some bloggers because we had this little blogger scene, we had parties and stuff, to be the people who wrote these blogs. And it was the first like commercial blogs. He put fake ads on it, because no advertisers wanted anything to do with blogs. It's like, that's distasteful. It's just opinion. So <laughs> Yeah, he, blo- like, blog, uh, that, that blog world was fucking huge. And now when you put it that way, I never really thought about it. Like I was... 
before places like Gawker that were kind of curating and collecting lots of different opinions and ideas like that, it was like I just had in my head a couple different websites that I typed in, you know, and like went to different like individual blogs. Uh, of Which indiv one? Tell me some. I'm trying to remember because it was like a long, long time ago. This is like the post 9-11 era. Um, what were they? I mean, what I, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember like a single one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> most, most of us failed to, uh, successfully brand for the long term. Yeah. I mean, it seems, but yeah, it there seems were like fun. it. There was, uh, who, oh, there was, who were uh, the big uh, ones? Remind a, me of the, of the famous bloggers of that era, because I feel, I feel like some of them must have continued. Right. I mean, some of them are still, well, there was, there was, uh, in my kind of crowd, there was Matt Welch. That who, name sounds you know, familiar. To Reason yep. and things like that. There was uh, uh, there was a like right leaning guy from uh, Knoxville called Glenn Reynolds. Mm, he had mm -hmm. one called Instapundent. Oh yeah, that, yeah. You know, he just linked to a million things a day, which at that time was a, a service because uh, there, was, there wasn't even Google News then. I remember uh, like Crooks and Liars was one. Yeah, 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 there was Crooks and Liars. There was uh, Marcos who had Daily Coast, Daily Costs, whatever. That's right. Yep. Uh, on the kind of like traditional Democrat liberal side. And they would, yeah. and they would like, uh, th like th to to give like uh, the kids an idea of what th this was like. It would be like they would have like a um, a clip from like the Daily Show on on the uh, on the blog, and it would be like a four minute clip of John Stewart like deconstructing something Donald Rumsfeld said, and it was like a. Uh, um, you had to you had to wait like a half an hour to download that video clip and watch it. Like that's that's and that, and that was several years going in when you can do video on blogs. Oh yeah, before that it was just, just text. Yeah, just text. You know, YouTube appeared, I believe, in two thousand five, and so the first kind of blogging wave was over and done by then. And but then a, a another one started up, and then you had these ones that were advertising supported. A lot they use blog ads, and then Google got in on the act. They started opening up the ad platform to. Um, it, this is a funny thing to think about, but mm -hmm. in the early two thousands, Google would not let independent writers, bloggers, journalists, whatever, have access to their ad platform. You had to be an approved news outlet, mm. an approved publication. That's I don't know crazy. Who, yeah. yeah, and of course like everything with Google, you know, they threw that out the window as soon as somebody smelled money somewhere else. And then you had the Gawker sites, uh, Wonkat, which I ended up taking over in mm -hmm. 2006. And Wonkat was like the political end of it, right? Like they were yeah, like, yeah, that was, yeah, that was DC. It was Anna Marie Cox did it first. She was a blogger that, uh, who had worked for suck in San Francisco and, the. Uh, Late 90s, Suck had Jake Tapper, Anna Marie Cox, Heather Haverleski, uh, a lot of interesting people. And it tended to have uh, that kind of anti establishment voice. It didn't have a set kind of politics. People love Suck in the late 90s. <laughs> Suck.com. I don't even know if, if there's archives even there anymore. So much has changed. I mean, I'm uh, you and I are people that uh, existed kind of uh, at the at the moment where you know you can like kind of like watch all this stuff actually appear. And now we're at a point twenty years later or something where it's evolved. I, I don't even know how to describe like what the media landscape looks like now. But I mean, you've you're still producing, but producing the type of media that I think a, a lot of people are you know, kind of consuming now, which is, you know, a, a person who's created like a, a brand, if that makes sense. And at what point did you, at what point did you decide to, to, to do a, a publication like Desert Oracle? Because it's a print publication. It's like, it's so refreshing. Like that's part of what drew me to it. When I went to Cactus Mart, I saw like, um, the, like, it looks like a chat book. It looks like something that I, I was kind of, you know, f studying, you know, I, I, I'm a professor. So like I studied, um, underground newspapers the 1960s and 70s and oh so, yeah so like seeing that like i was like oh this is kind of like a callback to, to to a different kind of engagement with media 
So it's it's interesting to well, me. I know, why did you go backwards? In other words, like what what was it that made you decide to go to print? So in 2014, I'd gone back to work for Gawker for the last time as their national correspondent, and it was fun. It was interesting to be there when Gawker was a big media company instead of a couple of kind of questionable characters working out of Nick's apartment on laptops. <laughs> but I had the sense that it was all about to collapse. Um, the entire business model and this company in particular. Mm. So, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really a crystal ball because they had this lawsuit, this threat of a lawsuit hanging over them with this Hulk Hogan thing. That's what I was going to say. I was like, what? Uh, my, my narrative in, in my head always has to do with Hulk Hogan's lawyers assassinating Gawker in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Gawker did something really stupid. You know, they they lost their way there for a while and became kind of a clickbait post whatever will get views. And that's not what it started off as. And that's not, I don't think, what drew people to the site. Um, it's funny it you was, say that because I, I, by that time, I, I, the, by the time Gawker disintegrated, I was almost like anti-Gawker. You know what I mean? Like, which is weird because yeah. when I first got to New York, I, it was 2003 and like I was on the Gawker boards and like people were making careers on the Gawker comment boards. Like there were amazing commenters and they were like really the snark was beyond. It was like it, to me, snark just meant like a, a almost like a layer of, of critical thinking, like a lay a, another layer of understanding. Um, it and, was, yeah, and, and, it, it, and it was very, you had to be very nimble. Yeah. And so my co-editor at Wonkat in the early years, he was a commenter. He was plucked out of the comments on Gawker by, uh, Corey, Corey Sika, who I'd done Sploid with in 2005, I think. Uh, and Alex Perrine got plucked out of the comments and he was our intern at Sploid. And then they put him over in charge of Wonkette. Shortly thereafter, he was like a uh, film school dropout from NYU, I think. He was like 19 or something. And he was just brilliant. And so Corey saw this, just plucked him out. And Alex Perrine has become this well-known political writer and commentator and everything to this day. He's at New Republic now. Yeah, that's right. I know that name. And he was one. Another one was, uh, oh God, I'll 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 lose I'll lose my place if I start remembering all all the yeah. talent that was found in comments. But you're totally right. I mean, it was just like people who had no entrance into the world of publishing found one, and Gawker was one of those places that recognized that because. Nick loved hiring people without reading their clips and mm. with them having no, even though he himself had the, the, the finest pedigree you could want. And so it's Nick. almost like part of why it fell apart though. Cause I started I, at, at some point the comments with, they became self-conscious as auditions in some way. You know what I mean? Uh, like all of a sudden I'm reading people that are, instead of it just being like an organic conversation, I'm seeing people that are trying very hard to write things that will get attention. It, but it always happens. Yeah. I mean, it happens and any kind of scene has the organic accident, which is rarely as organic as, as it might look from the outside mm -hmm. because it takes a sort of culture to make that open. And then it disintegrates and then there's money if you're lucky, but then the money corrupts and then you lose your way and then you die. I mean, that's like the tale as old as time. <laughs> right. It's just yeah, that. dude, it's like the arc of almost famous or something, you know, like just like yep. it's it's yeah. I mean, I so I taught a class on like um, on kind of like counterculture movements and stuff like that, like uh, skateboarding and hip hop and stuff like that. And I and specifically in L.A., I think that um um, it was called like fight the power in LA or something like that. But either way, 
like all those scenes went through that like the skateboarding especially you know you could see it like become like go from like this kind of organic thing to all of a sudden it's commercialized all of a sudden there are stars and all of a sudden their stars are drug addicts and celebrities and it just and then we wait for the next like innovation that seems cool it, right. it, it, it is right. familiar yeah yeah uh you know bill billy ruff from that skateboard scene yeah yeah, so he was he was the upright bass player in my rockabilly band. No in way. The eighties, yeah, and uh, yeah, Bill Ruff. Well, punk, you yeah. know, like the L.A. punk scene is a perfect example of that too. Oh, very much. I read and listened to the audio book. Both are great. Uh, the two books that were kind of put together by John Doe from X. Yeah. Uh, uh, Under the Big Black Sun and More Fun in the New World. Yeah, I'm looking at them right now. I actually had Alice Bag on the show um, a few months back, and we talked about those books because it's yeah. like it's it's reading those books is a fucking revelation, dude. Because like I, I'm someone who was not old enough to know that stuff, so I only saw like I only saw the stuff that was already been through that cycle. If that makes sense, you know what I mean? Like I by the time it got to me, I'm just seeing like Henry Rollins and shit like that, and like I'm not seeing like the other bands. I mean, even. Um, I don't know. Even some of the, the 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 smaller bands that that are that should have a lot more attention paid to them and were like the beginners of it all are totally forgotten, like totally erased from history. Yeah, and I mean the, even the Minutemen, like even the fucking Minutemen, like well, the, yeah. I mean, you know, I I've followed Watt uh, for forever. Yeah. So he's, <laughs> you know, he's he's to me he's like some Abraham Lincoln of punk, you know. And, it's such a sad story, dude. But <laughs> uh but <laughs> but I you know, I don't think I don't think Watt would describe it as a, a sad story other than losing his best friend. That's what I mean. You know, is the, early on, but yeah. the rest of his life he's I'm not done, talking about Watt. I'm talking about the, the him dying in the car crash. Yeah. 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 Uh, to, to D Boone going that way yep. it was yep. definitely uh, uh, a sad, and you, and you saw that with a bunch of bands. You know, you saw that with Darby Crash. You saw that with, uh, but the way you'd mostly see it is bands that get signed to a major, mm -hmm. and once they got signed to a major, they kind of took them out of circulation, and the the band that had created what the major wanted just dies with that. So, yeah, yeah. you know, X went through that. The blasters went through that. Um, very few, you know, lone justice, which is a big part of the, the second book, uh, more fun in the new world. Mm -hmm. A great cautionary tale of something that everybody said, Oh, this is going to be the big thing. You know, everybody wants a part of this, Bob Dylan and David Geffen and Bono and everything. And, it was uh, like a little honky tonk punk band, mm. uh, and it was a it was a massive flop. You know, so you saw this stuff. Uh, you also saw, getting back to what you're asking about about printed things, yeah. you saw the incredible explosion of creativity in cheap printed stuff like zines so yeah. a couple of my favorites were slash which ended up becoming a record label that eventually was distributed by warner brothers and uh, ben is dead which is a la based zine that was so fantastic um and even the alt weeklies which already felt kind of stale by then they felt like 70s relics mm -hmm. but they tried to keep up with this stuff so like um, Pleasant from Screaming Sirens wrote a, a scene column, I believe, for LA Weekly. And you could go to a record store and there'd be all these beautiful little zines that were all kind of hand laid out. There was Fact Sheet 5, you know, there was Maximum Rock and Roll out of the Bay Area. And I loved that print stuff. And I love the idea that you could go to Kinko's and your friend who was in another band who worked behind the counter would give you the copier key and you could go run off like a thousand copies of your zine for, for free. Yeah. You know, thanks to Kinko's and they'd throw the key back and say, Oh yeah, somebody ran off without paying or whatever. And so a lot of zines and band flyers and things came out of that. So 
King Gawker, Ga- yeah, Kinko's was a hot spot in the nineties. Like, oh, I, King, I, yeah, I, I got open so twenty four hours. Yeah, Kinko's. yeah, you show up, you could do anything. You could get a bass player, you could score drugs, you know, you'd make a date. It was. Yeah, I the, uh, one of my friends in high school worked at Kinko's and did like the late night shift overnight, you know, 24 hours. And like we, he was one of the coolest gatekeepers in the town because it was like Kinko's was where it was at. And now I put that together like I, I don't know if I really thought consciously that all these people are like making zines and stuff like that. But, you know, the, the coffee shops and record stores in town were where I accessed that stuff. And you're right. There was a kind of like moment like when like L.A. Weekly or. I don't know, different, different, like more established publications had comics in them from these and like kind of like had that sensibility a little bit. And or, there was there was some DIY thing going on. And it seems like I don't know, Desert Oracle seems like it's calling back to that a little bit. It it was I remembered that stuff fondly. I remember like getting L.A. Weekly and the late 80s and uh matt graining had a comic called life is hell that's right yeah which was great and then that would run right next to david lynch's single panel the angriest dog in the world shit yep i just read his biography or well he, he wrote a memoir slash biography it's really cool um because like it's like written by two people like one what each chapter is a story of his life told by like the biographer and then after that is a chapter by david lynch going over the same events oh so, yeah i read that is yeah. it, what is it called like the dream life or something yeah uh it's called room to dream yeah room to dream. yeah i'm looking at yeah, it. yeah. yeah. um and yeah i forgot and, and it has a lot of panels of his um of his comics that were in la weekly and it's you know that that like um that that thing that he does where he does the weather report was also like an example of he, he's someone who was was kind of an early adopter on internet stuff like he he had his own like blog and space where you could like pay to see bonus movies and stuff like that he did he yeah. did it was i forget what it was called you're Lynch convincing me here it. that yeah in the 90s in la were a very ripe kind of cultural moment it's weird that, well, it's, think, weird, it's weird that, that uh Lynch yeah was doing this was the early 2000s mm, mm-hmm. uh, he had a webcam in his studio that's at his right house. yep and he would give the weather report. My favorite weather report is he's got like this, I don't know what it is. It's like a medical dummy or something slumped <laughs> in a chair and kind of half dark. And he's doing the voice from behind it. You know, like, so. it's very <laughs> warm today. And, uh, the, there's, there's always stuff going on on the edges. And early in the Internet, a lot of the weird people who even though they had some mainstream success i mean lynn should be very much a good example of that they were attracted to anything where you could do stuff and get your vision directly to people Mm -hmm. because that's always the hard part with records and with movies and tv shows is so hard when you you look at, at at TV shows and movies, and it's like, all right, there's all these people who have all the resources, but they don't have anything to say. Yep, yep. And then you have the people who have something to say, and it's such a struggle to get what they see out there. So when I saw Gawker was going to go, I got out a year before, and nobody believed it was going to happen, but I knew it was going to happen. And it just, it felt like, you know, it, it felt uh, decadent. It was the end of an era. Mm. Too much money. You know, I, I mean, the idea, like, I they flew me out for a Christmas party and town cars pick you up and take you back and everything. Like, that's not, that's too much. That's, it, that's, it, it, no. that's the part of that story, that arc, where they've become the establishment in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very much. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I quit. And I had I ended up owning Wonkette during the previous recession. Nick gave it to me. They were trying to sell it, and they couldn't sell it. And they're like, all right, pay us a dollar so that you get all the liability for it. I said, mm-hmm. all right. So I mailed them a dollar bill, and I became publisher of Wonkette. I ran it through the Obama years, and I sold it to uh, a friend of mine, Rebecca, who used to be an uh, editor at OC, OC Weekly, and she had wanted to be Wonkette originally when it happened. She was like, oh, this should be me. So I got out of that business, and I needed to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. And so I took about 
six, eight months off, just kind of wandering around doing things that I liked, staying in monasteries, you know, Zen monasteries, Tassajara, uh, Catholic money, and any place where you could stay where it's quiet and you could just think. You went through a private 1970s. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I've always been, I don't want to want to say always, but definitely through most of my adulthood, I've been, uh, open to such things. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been, uh, uh, I've gone through all sorts of religious, um, Oh, hobby sounds so, so, so vulgar. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you're saying. It's, 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 it's hard to describe that, uh, what you're describing without using like buzzwords, you know, like, yeah, like yeah. It's, I, 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 sometimes I end up saying like, oh, I think of myself as a bit of a seeker and I'm like, fuck, no, I don't. Uh, but, right. no, no, like, don't say that, but but it's true. It's a trademark of goop now. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. When when Gwyneth Paltrow is doing acid on her Netflix show with a bunch of billionaires, like what what room is there for that for, to to say that? Uh, There's still yeah. room, and you know, I I have been lucky to have one of my my favorite writers, uh, really, just in general, be kind of a semi-regular on on my radio show uh eric davis yeah uh and we had him on the show here and yeah oh well eric davis and we've had daniel pinchbeck on and a couple others and we talk about we talk about drugs and aliens and shit like that on the show yeah yeah yeah. yeah. that's part of that i mean that's part it's funny that we're we're just getting to that at the end of the program because it's one of the primary things i wanted to talk to you about but maybe we'll do another ufo alien show at some point we'll throw it in there eric is someone who i think is a very good voice for this stuff staying weird. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it it you can't commodify the psychedelic experience once people have actually had it. Mm-hmm. There's just no way to brand it. You know, I mean, someone's going to try. Of course, you're going to say, "Oh, these are the best," you know, mushroom tablets to take so that you'll see the entities from your favorite sports team or whatever. (laughs) But so far it's just all too weird. And we've seen this time and again over the past half century, the psychedelic era, psychedelic culture being commodified, being sold, becoming a scene fading out, but it keeps coming back because there's a lot more to it. Uh, So I was not, seeking any particular thing i just wanted space to think without the internet blasting into my brain all the time because it had gotten it it went from being something that was very liberating and exciting 20 years prior to something that was oppressive and ugly and seemed to dis, d- diminish any effort or talent that went into it just by, <laughs> by virtue of the medium being corrupted. Yeah. So yeah. I thought, I love the desert. I live in the desert. I'm going to make something that I would like to buy and that I would like to work for. And that will let me combine a number of kind of characters and personalities that I've been in my life into something that I can get up and do all day and enjoy. Mm. So that was the end of 2014. I started publishing in 2015. In 2017, I started the radio show at uh, KCDZ here in Joshua Tree. And now it's on six stations, I think. And then most people listen on podcasts, but I love, I love broadcast radio. So that's the part that keeps me interested in in that uh more than the the podcasting side which to me looks like another thing that's got a bunch of fuzz from everybody trying to turn it into the next thing like i saw rogan is going exclusive to spotify this morning is he really yeah no so we're in that era and in you know podcasting already went through two of these phases so this is the second commercial phase of podcasting and I think it's going to kind of burn out in the next six months or so. And you'll be left with people creating things that are meaningful to them. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I started this podcast in 2014. Um, and, you know, just as basically at the tail end of graduate school, I just wanted to record some of my professors um, and get their voices on uh, out there. And I didn't really think of it as, as much. And it, slowly over time, it evolved into like having a Patreon and everything like that. But like, you know, watching it, you're right. I feel like this, the, 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 the particular podcast scene that I was a part of was a little bit like associated with Brooklyn and like the left and like Jacobin magazine and Chapo trap house. And, and all, that almost seems like another like little flash that's happening right now. And you're right. I mean, I don't I don't fucking know where it's going to be in six months. I mean, it seems like every like the quarantine moment, um, Amazon sold out podcast equipment. You know what I mean? Like people, everybody, right. everybody wants to make a podcast all of a sudden. And if you can make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month on Patreon, it seems like people are going to figure out how to turn that into the next, you know, kind of gawker moment. Like, in other words, we're in that same cycle. We, we're, we're in that cycle. And where there are a. A handful of examples of of people who are doing exactly what they want and making a living off of it, but it's a handful. Right. It's, it's not like a model that everybody can profit from. No, it's not. Because again, you get you gotta have you gotta have something. You can't just be. You know, you see every time I I, I have to go into iTunes once a week to uh, make sure everything got there okay. Mm -hmm. And so I open it up and every week they're pushing some, some other celebrity doing a, a corporate podcast. Yes. And I look at these things and I'm like, you know, I don't know. Do I need to hear, uh, uh, 52 episodes a week from, from a guy who played a superhero in a Marvel movie or something? <laughs> do they have anything to say? No, they have something that they do that's different. And they're getting paid through an agency and a production company and everything else to do this. And a couple of them will stick, but most of them are just going to disappear without a trace. It's like, you know, what was said about Obama uh, after his president, his second term ended. Is like, oh, what's Obama going to do? And people were real excited for about three minutes because, oh, he's going to Netflix. He's going to be a TV star. That's right. He did something for Netflix that sank like a stone. Nobody ever saw it. Nobody ever heard of it again. And it's like, wow, that was the most popular guy in the world. And you cannot force compelling content out of people that don't have anything to say. Yeah. That, I mean, and that feels like there's just a fucking dead end. I mean, when when you look at iTunes, I mean, I've you know been looking at it for years and years too, and it's just been basically like more and more of exactly what you're talking about. Like, you know, John Ham, you know, makes a sandwich and like is going to show you how to do. Like, it just it seems like it's just empty. Like, it seems like a cultural dead end. But it's weird to exist on the same page as that shit. You know what I mean? Like, there's like there's Joe Rogan and there's like the big big boys and there's Desert Oracle on the same page, and it just doesn't seem yeah. it, it's it's really a weird moment it does seem transitional well i it's it's a moment i i love these moments when you can still do something as an individual artist or writer or you know broadcaster whatever the hell you are and have it get in now that it's that door is probably already closed <laughs> for anybody you know it's really yeah because uh when I started Desert Oracle Radio, there were so few travel podcasts, that's the category I'm in, that Desert Oracle Radio was often at the top of the charts. Mm. You know, this went on for a couple of years. And then all these companies started producing, you know, Condé Nast and uh, cruise lines and whatever, all start producing travel podcasts. The funny thing is, audience size for Desert Oracle is a lot bigger than it was when we were atop those those charts several years ago. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, things it, it's what, you know, what what happened? Um I think it's the same thing that always happens that you already brought up that things go through a cycle mm -hmm. and the the last cycle when people start throwing money at it is always the least interesting. That's so, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. But what is it, let's let's uh, you you want to talk about aliens? Get some aliens in here before before we, we sound like uh, 
like a couple of <laughs> we're like it, the glory days were are long behind us well that's part of yes. it and, and you know i i don't be, i don't believe that i believe no that dude i mean i honestly we were think it's going to open up and i'll tell you what i'm looking at right now the things that are going to open up that i'm that i've got my feelers please in. uh one is well they're both they're both uh, sides of the same coin is over the air broadcasts mm. over the air broadcasts radio had something like this all the little stations were bought up by these huge conglomerates now all the conglomerates are collapsing they have been for years before this current advertising depression so they are getting rid of stations yeah it is so cheap to get into radio right now on broadcast level because the audience is gone. Mm. So you have an opportunity to do something in a place that doesn't require any streaming fees. It doesn't require uh, any investment of equipment that's portable. You can't be tracked. You can't be traced. Nobody can sell your information from turning on a AM FM radio and sitting on your porch and, you know, drinking a beer mm. and listening to something weird. So it's why I love community radio stations and you can listen to them because of streaming. You can listen to them from all over the country or the world. So I've got you know, dozens of college stations, community stations, low power FMs. And these things have better content than anything on any of the NPR, you know, flagship stations. They're interesting. They are kind of bootstrapped. You know, they survive by selling some local ads and getting a little money. And the other thing that's going to be like that, and it's already starting, is just you know, technology. It's always the outliers that find it first. He used to say, hey, you know, a technology is viable when porn does it, right? No, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so in television, it's you know something is viable when uh, foreign language small communities are using it. It's cost effective and it reaches who they want to reach. So you go on over the air TV in Los Angeles, say, and you can do this with like a $12 antenna plugged into your regular flat screen TV. They have tuners mm. and you can get like a dozen Korean stations and you can get stations in Farsi, and you can get weird religious things. Can I really do that with my Costco flat screen TV? You should be able to, yeah. Crazy. Now, I don't know how many you'd have in Ventura. You probably have a couple you can pick up. Um, I don't have any that I can pick up out here in, in the desert. In the low desert down by Palm Springs, there's a number of them you can pick up, these kind of digital sideband channels. You're describing a kind of post-apocalyptic world in some ways, or uh, uh, but even that's what I'm hoping. For. But even like, but even like, uh, it makes me think of the ham radio guys in the '80s. Um, that there was always, you know, one or two usual men in the neighborhood that had a "Don't Tread on Me" flag outside their house and a bunch of fucking antennas on top of the roof, and they were doing right. that kind of stuff, which was always like felt weirdly like, um, you know, off the grid and countercultural in some way. Oh, it, it is because it's 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 independent. It's it's people with their own equipment, their own technology. When the Northridge quake, not Northridge, which quake was it? Yeah, Northridge in ninety four. Uh, no, this was a oh, this was a big quake that hit uh, during a baseball game in San Francisco. Oh yeah, that was the 80, 80, 89. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. was on the news desk, and all the lines went down. You know, the wire service lines, everything went down. So I got on my laptop and got on CompuServe, and there was, a, there was like a, a, a news group there. So there were hams, radio hams, who were on the live message boards on CompuServe communicating with people in the Bay Area, and I was in Southern California. So I, I got enough to you know write a story when the wire was down coming out of the Bay Area. So the, these kind of – these technologies that are there, but they don't make enough money to attract – the vultures are always the the places where interesting new stuff starts up. So well, it all, and it's sometimes yeah. things that have been abandoned by everybody else. So print, mm -hmm. everyone's oh print is dead. Print abandoned print. Da da da. That's when it's good to get in there. Just do something. That that's great advice. That's, that makes sense too. I mean, it, it, in this moment too, it's like kind of who knows where things are going. I mean, there's in, in, part of me you know thinks. 
you know, we're sitting here transferring our whole society over to like fucking Zoom meetings and online. Everything. What would happen if Wi-Fi went down? What would, and, and like people don't even think about that kind of possibility. It's almost like so, a, a scenario that seems impossible to people. But, you know, my dad works in, worked in telecommunications for like 40 years. And he's always telling me how much more fragile the system is. Um, and then like to me, it's like, OK, well, then we would be all doing pirate radio if all of that. Yeah. Cause, Cause I mean, we are more online right now and more dependent on like the internet than we've ever been. And that part of it is like kind of terrifying because it means if it weren't there instantly, like what would the social situation in the United States look like? It's going to look a little different. <laughs> and that's, a, that's an open I, question. <laughs> it, it may actually look better yeah. when we no longer driven by the loudest and most extreme opinions on everything. Mm, yeah would be nice uh, well, you, we'll you, see. you describe that like and, gawker world you know like to, it, it's i think it's 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 important to point out that like when i was first going to gawker and like reading all these opinions like it was on a computer like i literally went to a desk and looked at the computer and like fl- uh, you know flicked through all these different opinions but then when i was done with it i was done with it at some point all of those opinions were in my pocket and like they're in there and they're in my phone and i can like literally now scroll through them on my phone and i think there's like a there's a big difference between those two things. In other words, it's like an acceleration of that fucking, you know, a, a, a monster of extreme opinion you're talking about. It's an acceleration of the technology to deliver that into your mind. Well, I've been having this conversation with Jay Babcock, who was the editor and publisher of Arthur magazine. Which I remember was, uh, Arthur. Yeah. 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 Really. And Eric Davis wrote for Arthur. Yeah, uh, uh-huh. Very, very influential 2000s uh, alt culture publication psychedelic and, yeah psychedelics yeah. Uh, music all kinds of stuff so jay's out here in joshua tree as well and he had told me recently that some of this 5g hysteria you know has spread to our area you got people like shooting up uh verizon sheds on hilltops and Jesus. Paying, you know no 5g and stuff and he was uh, rightly, you know, disgusted at this kind of dumb stuff. Five G causes coronavirus, whatever. <laughs> but I have, I have a lot of sympathy for the, these these outpourings of of discontent and rage because there's something going on there, mm-hmm. and it's an it, the the thing itself may be stupid. You know the I. I think the example I used for uh, when I was talking to Jay was, was uh, like the Boston Tea Party. What a stupid thing, you know, <laughs> racist, ignorant, rich business people, you know, uh, basically being obnoxious because they can, knowing that they won't pay any price, they won't be arrested, whatever. And yet, you know, it ended up being a, uh, a flashpoint for a, a revolution solution that really wasn't in the cards before that mm. and you can say the same thing about all kinds of accidental revolutions you know it's mm-hmm. like uh you know christianity ended up being a really big deal but it ultimately started because whatever jesus's good things he was also just kind of like a rage nut <laughs> and he goes into the the temple and like attacks you know all these merchants who were licensed and allowed to be there. They weren't doing anything wrong, and that's what ultimately leads to his crucifixion, right? Mm-hmm. And and you have this, so it's kind of like a stupid accidental thing. Like that probably wasn't the point, right? Right. <laughs> you know, and yet it ended up happening. So you're so. saying that the five the the rage at five G. As stupid as it might be, because like who, 5G creating the coronavirus, it might be a silly idea, but it points to some sort of like bubbling, um, I don't know, anti-technological rage. I think, yes. te- I think technology maybe might just be the the symbol of like, it's, yeah, yeah, the larger the civilizational part moment. Especially because mm-hmm. it's like nobody asked us to carry around these surveillance devices all the time. We just did it mm-hmm. and we pay for it. And we're all uneasy about it. Yeah. And every time there's uh, 
whether it's a Washington Post, like wine mom story about what what your yoga app is reporting back to you to the company or whatever, or if it's like Fox News, you know, drink bleach or whatever, the truth <laughs> they don't want you to know. It's all the, it's all different sides of this same discomfort that you're being watched all the time. And as, you know, Warren Zevon wrote long ago, uh, there's people always trying to tell you something that they already know, so their anger and resentment grow. Uh, that yeah. Muhammad Radio. Uh-huh. So all these flashpoints, I think, are interesting to watch because they usually... Yeah, I was at Wonk Cat during the Tea Party stuff, and people are like, look at these idiots, look at these you know, buffoons, what clowns, da-da-da, we'll mock them with snark. Yes. Like, yeah. No, yep. that ain't going to work with this. There's something going on here. No, I totally agree. That that part of it seems like a really key uh, a, a key part of it, and it also seems like very early in all of this. You know what I mean? Like when I, when I look at those like, um, you know, 5G protests or whatever that might be. That just seems like one part of, like, I'm imagining this book about this moment, you know, this this history book written in decades from now that'll take, you know, things like that and describe them in, like, one little chapter about, like, these all these collected phenomena that kind of pointed us to something. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, it do, and it seems like that's... that's um, right now we're in a moment that there are more that the landscape of possibilities has shifted dramatically and like there all of a sudden the things that um because you and I both I, I feel like you and I both share kind of an apocalyptic sensibility in part and like it seems like this this is it, it, it's in part scary because it seems like oh shit maybe I was right about all these years like the sensing that like something fucking dramatic was going to happen right in front of our eyes but it does seem like that's we're at least in the beginning stages of something like that it, yeah, and my view of kind of apocalyptic things is not in the modern sense of of destruction, right? Yes, but in the in the the biblical sense of an awakening, a revelation. I'm with you on that. So I'm not thinking like Michael Bay happening. apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, that's that's a that's a very good descriptor. Uh, <laughs> I wrote it. I wrote a novel ten years ago called Dignity, mm. and it was one of the, it was really the only time I've ever written fiction when it just kind of blasted out of space at me, mm-hmm. and it was like, oh, what the hell is this? All right, it's not how I write. It's not my style, you know. It's not snarky or whatever, um, which was useful because I figured out, oh, I don't have to write like that anymore. I can do <laughs> you know, something different. I can do something more hard on the sleeve and not lose the way that I write. Mm. So I write this book. I had all these visions of this scene that was taking place in this urban area. And it was this sort of like awakening sort of thing. And the cops were coming in and it was like this concrete park and whatever. I put it in LA and uh, around downtown and echo park because I wanted to make the rest of the story in the desert, so outside L.A. So I published a book. I self-published it because I was contracted to Harper at the time for this California coast, which never came out. And the the imprint was shut down in the recession, Harper Studio. Uh, so I put this thing out. Six months later, I see the pictures from Zuccotti Park and I was, Jesus Christ, that's it. That's the place. <laughs> that's what I was, it, it wasn't in LA at all. Occupy Wall Street. So, yeah. So I get on a plane, I go spend a couple weeks there and it was, that was it, you know? And I talked to people who had come from all over the world, all over North America. And so many people had had a vision of that place months before. So as soon as they saw it on social media or on the news, they're like, I got to go. You know, it's like Richard Dreyfus with the mashed potatoes. Fucking crazy. So it was wild. And then I got back and tried to write something positive out of it. And instead, all I kept getting was like these people who start this sort of post-commercial, post-capitalism kind of uh, community life that in in my version starts up an abandoned 
the housing tracks in mm-hmm. Southern California out in the desert because cool. after the housing crash, they were they were everywhere. You know, the, like half finished houses. I think there were like thirty thousand un uh, like empty houses outside of Las Vegas in two thousand nine, something like that. Oh, yeah. it was incredible, and a lot of them, like you know, Lehman Brothers. The straw that broke the camel's back was in the Western Mojave in Victorville. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the one thing that they, when when the uh, when the debt was due, that began the fall in uh, uh, the end of 2008, right uh-huh. there in the Mojave. Uh-huh. So the thing that, instead of something, I don't know, inspirational, after that, all I kept seeing was like these, these, the people who joined this following at the end, but they all go kind of crackpot, and so they they start blowing up cell towers mm. <laughs> because the kind of profit character and dignity in the first book was trying to get people to stop living their their lives run by their their computer, phone, and and video screens. So the radicals took it too far, and they're blowing up cell towers. So I see the 5G thing. I'm like, yeah, that's the, that's the next thing that happens because the rage, where do you focus your rage when it's just in the air all around you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mm-hmm. think it comes from that antenna on the hill. <laughs> and, you know, the cell tower stuff has been going on for a long time. People are like, oh, the cell towers, they cause cancer, they cause autism. This has been going on for like, you know, we've had battles over cell towers where I live. Oh, yeah. And people come to the meetings and that's, so the 5G thing did not like hatch out of one egg. Right, right. And, and, and the fact that it's connected to coronavirus just seems incidental. Because it's just like the perception that this is poison in one way or another. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. I think. I mean, I, 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 who knows? You know what I mean? Like, we're at a, again. Like, I feel like we're at a historical moment that we'll be looking back on and being like, "Fuck, didn't know, didn't see that coming." Um, but at the same time, yeah, there is some sort of cycle we're caught in, and I, and my hope is just like yours in describing, you know, apocalypse. It's not about you know the end of the world in terms of this big spectacle, but instead this. Um, transformation. And like, I don't think anyone would deny that this is a transformative era. Um, and, and where that transformation goes is to me, the question is like, how much do we direct any of it? And how much are we just going to like, just watch it happen on the local level? We can do a lot. I'm looking at all the cities opening up streets to pedestrians only. Berkeley is going to open up a big chunk of telegraph to only restaurants and bars so they can get out again and no more cars i mean a lot of this stuff people are saying oh wait a minute how come we couldn't do that before yeah you, a lot of it's not a that margarita hard. home <laughs> why, why can't we take a margarita home yeah why well i think a lot of people are sitting here at doing you know zoom shit or whatever working at home and they're thinking like why did i go to an office like all the time you know yeah. and like th- those are big questions those are like that that's like kind of a radical transformation you're right and like that part of it to me is just Ugh, uh, it's exhilarating to be a part of. And, and you're right. And in the sense of like, and maybe just to, to wrap this up, Ken, thank you so much for talking with me. But like, oh, you're welcome. you know, Thanks I want to, yeah, for sure. I mean, I want to talk with you because Desert Oracle, you're one of these people that's kind of, you know, representing a, a certain kind of regional sensibility when it comes to culture and politics and things like that. And I think, you know, in this, whatever comes out of the pandemic, that's one of the better things that come out of it. I know it's like, it's it, if you're from California, I know you've seen the hippie bumper sticker that says like "Think global, act local" or whatever. But it seems yep. like that's real, you know. Like some of those cliches, some of those hippie cliches are actually true. And like uh, it might be the best thing that come out of this is us kind of living that out in a different way. Yeah, we have a opportunity here to actually be part of the place where we live. Mm-hmm. Yep. To know our neighbors because we're out seeing them every day. To have an idea of what's going on to influence what's going on. A lot of these things are happening because people are calling the town hall or city hall and saying, hey, we can't go to the beach. Well, you better open up some streets for us to walk in. We're not going to have our kids mowed down by somebody using uh, the app to get around traffic. Right, right. Uh, Thanks, Ken. I appreciate talking with you. Hope we can chat about aliens a little bit more at some point. But thanks, uh, thanks we'll, a lot. We'll for do, we'll do al- aliens maybe next time. We're we're the, we're the aliens right now. That's right. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, cool. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, David. Bye. Bye. All right. Big thank you to my guest, Ken Lane of Desert Oracle. Had a really fun time getting to know him. I hope you did too. Go over to desertoracle.com. Check out his stuff. It's really fun. It really gives entry into a whole world in the desert uh, that I think a lot of people in the larger media uh, are, are missing. So go check that out um, and go check out patreon.com slash nostalgia trap if you want to access our bonus episodes. And remember that I have a lecture on Friday uh, online thinkolio.org. I'll be talking about The Big Lebowski in the 1960s. Very excited. I'm preparing that lecture now, uh, coming across all sorts of weird connections uh, with that movie to the 60s. So if you want to check that out, go to thinkolio.org, and that's where you can find me this week. Okay, hope you enjoyed this, and we will talk to you again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.